but I hope it will be sufficient to do honor to the text and for your listening this morning that you would know these words God has given to us. We're building on something that we started last week. It was the text that led into today's scripture, so it's a continuing if you were with us last week. If not, you might want to go back and read from an earlier portion of this part of Luke's gospel. I need to do this aside because I did it at the early service, and even though we've added some things now, it's, uh, I think it's important that I say this in uh, both services. I'm uh, going to challenge you to think about what you're going to do during Lent. The uh, Lenten season starts, as we said, on the 10th with our Ash Wednesday observance here. But I would like to have you think about your regular attendance in church. It comes up in the scripture here today. Jesus was in his hometown of Nazareth. And the scripture, Luke's gospel, adds a little aside. We're going to be reading Luke a lot during Lent. And so this kind of leads into my saying to you that Jesus never missed church. At least... That's what the scripture says. When he came to Nazareth on the Sabbath day, he went up to the synagogue as was his custom. The reason that's important is we have a lot of folks who are members of this church who don't always attend. Now, I'm trying not to look at anyone in particular. I don't want you to feel I'm being unkind to you, but I believe God wants us to participate. Now, part of the problem is we've grown enough over the years that if you all show up on one weekend, we don't have room for you all. That's, the, that's a fact. But we're planning and hoping to build a new facility. You know about that, right? Yeah, it's much in our conversations these days. We are anticipating that in the near future we'll have a space where all of our members and a lot of folks who have not yet joined us, some who have not yet come to faith in Christ, there'll be a place for everyone. But we need to build toward that with a faithfulness. And I believe, even though it may get crowded, I hope you will not miss a single week during Lent. And then once we get to Easter, I'm going to tell you something else. Something like, now that you're in the habit. I have this phrase. I couldn't get rid of it. It's just been coming to me all week. Every member, every week. Every member, every week. Now I know things come up. You can't always be here. But folks... Jesus felt it was important to be in worship. I don't know where that gives us any wiggle room to use worship attendance as discretionary. It is a right. I believe it's a duty. I believe it's an obligation. I know that it's a privilege. So, you'll hear a little more about that. We're going to read now from that Gospel of Luke, which will be much a part of our thinking in these next weeks. It begins in the 21st verse of chapter 4, ends with verse 30. This is for us today the word of the Lord. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of their town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through their midst of them and went on his way. The word of God for the people of God. Join me again for a moment of prayer. Lord, we're in a bind with our time, but we pray we would not rush our thinking upon the word that we have just experienced again. May you speak through this word, whether it's in ways we understand or ways beyond our understanding. 
to help bring our hearts, our souls into alignment with your purpose. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I will be sensitive to the time. We'll try to expedite, but let me remind you of something that has come into the culture in recent years. When a bunch of bad things happen, usually not good things, they, they converge. There's a phrase that's come to pass. Have you heard it? That turned out to be a perfect storm. Have you heard anybody say that? Have you said it yourself? And I got to thinking about that. When I read this text, I thought, oh my, what Jesus was experiencing and what the people in Nazareth were expecting, that was a perfect storm. So I did a little looking, and it's a, a fairly new phrase in our culture. It, is the, it describes the confluence of events that drastically aggravates a situation. And again, that sounds to me like what happened in Nazareth that day. You may have seen the movie back in the year 2000 uh, called The Perfect Storm. It starred George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg. It was actually based on a book that was written back in 1997 by Sebastian Younger. And it was the reference of a real experience, a real event. It was the loss of a fishing boat with all hands out of Gloucester, Massachusetts. The ship was called the Andrea Gale. Do you remember? you know about that? Actually, that was describing events that took place in 1991. It was late October. A powerful nor'easter had developed off the coast of Nova Scotia and was working its way southeastward toward New England. And it collided with and then absorbed Hurricane Grace that was making its way up along the eastern seaboard. And that confluence of weather made for a perfect storm. In that fact, that's where that phrase came from. Two weather broadcasters or news broadcasters in Boston were talking about how these things came to pass. And one said to the other, this situation is the perfect storm. Well, that convergence caused over $200 million of property damage, and at least 13 lives were lost, including the crew of the Andrea Grace. However, most of the raging force of this colossal storm was spent out at sea, where the unfortunate Andrea Gale was lost. A buoy off the coast of Nova Scotia recorded a wave, now listen to this, that was 100.7 feet tall, almost 101 feet tall. Can you imagine a wave? I mean, I've been out in swells of six and eight feet, and that's kind of frightening. The power of a wave, 100 feet tall, no wonder it wreaked such havoc. According to Luke's Gospel, it was a Sabbath day in Nazareth in the early days of Jesus' public ministry when such a confluence of events came together to drastically aggravate the situation. You know, it started out well enough. Jesus recently heralded everywhere he went. We know from Luke's record that whenever Jesus preached, he preached with power and authority. Whenever he taught, people said, we never heard anyone teach like this. We know that Jesus had healed people that were sick. Also, we know that Jesus had just returned from his temptation in the wilderness, and the scripture describes it this way. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and a report concerning him went out through all the country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Can you imagine the folks at Nazareth? You know, Nazareth wasn't much of a town. In fact, in John's Gospel, when they said, we found the Messiah, he's from Nazareth, they said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was a kind of a backwater town, not a whole lot going on. It was a very provincial town. Down the road, there was another town called Caesarea. Caesarea was on the coast of the, the Sea of Galilee. It was a a very happening place. It was a fishing village, a lot coming and going there. Jesus went there and he did some mighty things in Capernaum. And the folks up in Nazareth began to hear the reports. And I imagine they were kind of excited that this prophet, this Jesus, this boy of Joseph, according to the scripture, was on his way up. He was going to come and visit with the folks at home. The report about him spread through all the surrounding countries. It was Will Willimon, I think, who said something along this line. High and mighty Capernaum may have looked down on us in the past, but no preacher for Capernaum ever turned heads like our boy Jesus. A little bit of elitism showing up. Well, the truth is, Jesus did come home 
and he was much anticipated, and they knew he'd be in church because he went to the synagogue, what was the phrase? As was his custom. So they knew if Jesus was there over the weekend, they'd see him in church. He'd grown up there. He never missed. He went and studied scriptures there. It was the Torah school for the area. I can see it now. The folks in Nazareth were planning a new sign out at the edge of the village. Welcome to Nazareth, hometown of Jesus. Yeah, it started out really well, and if Jesus had played it right, it would have gone all right. But no, the perfect storm was brewing, a confluence of circumstances that was about to aggravate the situation. If Jesus would have just left go at reading the scroll of Isaiah and sat down and been quiet. But no. Scripture tells us as he sat down, every eye was fixed on him. And as you know, rabbis stood to read but sat to teach. And he sat down and began to teach. Then he began to say to them today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Even at that, if he didn't stop there. You know, Jesus grew up in this town. He was recently baptized by John the Baptist. The story of his baptism tells us that the scripture says this, when Jesus had been baptized, he was praying and the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form as a dove and a voice came from heaven, thou art my beloved son, with thee I am well pleased. Jesus now knew without any certain, the certainty, without any doubt, that he was who he believed he was. He'd been out in the wilderness now. He had been challenged by the devil and he had made the decision to serve God and be the vo voice and the presence of God in the world as God had called him to be. And then the scripture tells us he returned to Galilee where Nazareth is found and he was in the power of the Spirit. Now remember, Jesus is the only Son of God the only son of the father. John's gospel tells us so. Remember, he knew these people. He knew their perspective. He knew their failings. He knew their narrow-minded. He knew where their goat was tied. I grew up in a coal mining town over in Cambria County. And you know, a lot of what I learned when I was a youngster was bad information. How about you? Did you get taught a lot of stuff that you had the sense unlearn? I mean, I was taught prejudice. I was taught elitism for the people like myself and let the rest of the world, well, whatever. A lot of the things that I was taught, and by well-meaning people, it wasn't that they were evil, they were just very provincial. They had a very narrow perspective. They did not see the world, at least not as a group. There were spectacular individuals who rose above this, but my common experience as a youngster growing up in a small town in an out-of-the-way place was that I was not very well schooled in the things of God. My community did not have that perspective. Evidently, Jesus couldn't be quiet. He was filled with the presence of God and he knew these people and he knew that when he spoke these words that day, he was talking to them about God's purposes, knowing that their understanding of God's purpose was twisted. It was stilted. Knowing that they had a lot of cultural things that had drifted into the faith that were not pure things of God. Evidently, it was a perfect storm raging in Christ's heart. The way of God was not the way of his hometown folks in Nazareth. And to make it worse, they thought they knew who he was. And they would have liked to have seen him do some of the things that he'd done somewhere else. Their perspective, their understanding, their rituals, their teaching were crashing into one another. The things that Jesus knew and the things that he experienced. There in that little confines of the synagogue in Nazareth, a perfect storm was brewing. I can imagine Mary, you know, Jesus' mother. Surely she had a kind of a sense of this. Wherever Jesus went, people sensed in him the power and the presence of God. When he read the scripture, they were all happy with, with him at Nazareth. He sat down, he began to teach them. Now this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And Mary was probably over in the corner saying, that's it, good, good. And then Jesus said, no doubt you're going to tell me to 
physician heal yourself. It's kind of a, a little bit of a convoluted understanding, but it gets a little more clear when Jesus said, you've heard I've done some amazing things down at Capernaum and in some of those other places, and no doubt you'd like to see me do them here. But I know you folks, and I know your view of the world, and let me tell you, the kingdom of God and what you're doing are not aligned. Well, who is this guy? What, who does he think he is? His family's here. We knew him when he was a little kid. He grew up here. Where does he got off telling us about the kingdom of God? The very Christ of God in their presence and their narrow-mindedness and their prejudice could not help them but see that they were there to tell Jesus how it should be. You know, somebody has wisely said that. We tend to create God in our own image. You know, we, we work at our faith to get God agreeing with everything we do. St. Paul talked about this. He said in the end times, people accumulate for themselves teachers that tell them what they want to hear rather than the truth. Jesus walked into the synagogue that day with his heart filled with the things of God and the people there were expecting attaboy, Jesus. And what he told them instead is, let me tell you, there are two places in Scripture where, and I believe, this is me, I, there's no Scripture to back this up, I believe that Jesus had had this conversation with them in the past. When they talked about Old Testament scriptures from First and Second Kings, there was a widow who sheltered the prophet Elijah. And that's a wonderful story. And if you read the story, but she wasn't part of the kingdom. She was not a Jew. She was a foreigner. And I believe as a youngster, Jesus talked to them and said, look what God did through this person. And then he makes it worse. He said, you remember Naaman the leper? There were lots of lepers in Israel in the time that this story took place, but only one, a foreigner, a Syrian, the Naaman, the leper, only one was healed. People took umbrage at that. They said, why is God being nice to these foreigners? And Jesus brought it up on his homecoming at Nazareth. And Mary was in the corner. Let it go. The truth of the matter is, they understood that Jesus was accusing them of not really being in the center of God's will. When they heard this, all the synagogue was filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. I've preached some bad sermons, but that never happened. <laughs> Yet. You know, I'm, I know I'm pressing the time here. Jesus knew them well. They thought they knew Jesus well. Their view of the kingdom of God and this emerging awareness of the presence of God in Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ of God, were not compatible. It was the perfect storm. Martin Luther once said this about the Bible. Here is the word that first kills in order to make alive, that damns in order to bless. Preaching is something akin to surgery, Luther said. You know, if we were perfect as we are, we wouldn't need Jesus. But we're not, are we? I was taught a lot of bad stuff. I've had to unlearn a lot of it. You were taught a lot of stuff that isn't true. We've been misled by people who were well-meaning. People who loved us and cared for us, but they didn't have the fullness of the truth. None of us do. That's why we turn to the Word of God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor who was hung by the Nazis in the closing days of World War II, wrote this. Preaching allows the risen Christ to walk among his people. That's why we read the Word, and that's why preachers risk to stand before you and share these thoughts. My job, and Will Williman said this as well, my job is to turn Jesus loose in the room. And when I do, it should impact what you're thinking, believing, and doing. It sure happened that way in Nazareth. Jesus let them know that you folks don't understand and you're not about to let me tell you. Scripture goes on to say he could do few mighty works in that place. You know, this is not uncommon in Luke's gospel. In the parables that we'll be studying in the coming weeks, 
There's a story about a Pharisee, a religious man, and a sinner, a publican, who go up to the altar to pray. And one of them prays out of his righteousness, and the other one prays out of his awareness of his sin. And the scripture tells us that it was the sinner who was blessed that day. This kind of reversal. Remember the story of two brothers. One asked his dad for all of his inheritance, went off and blew it in riotous living. And then the older brother at home was so angry when he returned. Or like Luke telling us about the grand banquet that is being given and people were invited to God's banquet, but they had more important things to do. And so they were all shunned, and then the word was to go out into the highways and byways and bring anybody who will come because God wants them all together. When Christ is in our presence, as he was that day in Nazareth, we have to reconsider our position. We are either drawn to Christ or we're repelled from Christ. Either Christ is making sense to us or we want to argue with him. I came to faith at a a revival service when I was 12 years old, and I remember feeling the weight of my sin as a 12-year-old, that I knew I needed a Savior, and I came to the altar, and I asked God to forgive me, and I asked God to allow Christ to grow in my heart. It didn't happen overnight. For me, it's been kind of like waves gently washing up on the shore, changing the coastline of my life by its repetitive action over a long period of time. Do I still have a ways to go? Ask my wife, (laughs) who's not here this morning. (laughs) But I've known other people when the perfect storm of understanding God's love in my life, it's like a hundred-foot wave that comes crashing against the shoreline, and it changes the whole landscape in a moment. I don't know how it is for you, whether your faith is gradually growing or whether you've had one of those cataclysmic moments when your life changed at that moment, but the point is it must change. The kingdom of God is not the way I'm living. Christ holds the kingdom of God before us and say, this is what God says. Come and join into this thing that God has revealed in Christ. And they said, no, I'm not interested. That's what they said in Nazareth. In fact, they were going to throw him over the cliff. When Jesus comes into our life, he does create a storm. Things get tossed around. Perspectives change. Ideas are reshaped. Our narrow view is replaced with God's view. Can you imagine a hundred-foot wave crashing in on us? That's what happened that day in the synagogue in Nazareth. And that's what can happen in our lives if we allow Jesus to enter into our hearts. Something to think about. Pray with me. Thank you, Lord, for this day, a day in which we have visited with folks far away from us in Uganda, a day in which two small children are gathered into the names of those who are people of the kingdom. Thank you, Lord, today for the witness of this congregation in this community and in the world. But, Lord, we pray today that you would help us now consider again whether your word and your purpose is transforming our lives, whether a process over a long period of time or the suddenness of a tidal wave. We pray that we will not create you in our image, but rather we will seek you and allow our lives to become centered, focused, and reshaped in the way which you invite. This is our prayer as we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.